ladies and gentlemen, rural America has a serious sanitation issue, especially with hookworms. That's what you're looking at on the screen. Now, there were some pictures of people with hookworms in their feet. Those pictures were so gross, I could not even show it to you. Well, you can go out there and look at them on your own. <laughs> I, at first, I had one up as the avatar. It was just too gruesome looking. I couldn't show it. But this is a problem that's going on in rural America, and it's over the poor sanitation that's going on in these areas of the country. When you look at some of the feet that these hookworms are in, which is normally in intestines, well, it's all mixed in the soil. So you got a parasite problem because that's all hookworms are. So I have a 37 minute audio from NPR on this November 23rd, 2020, that I'm going to have you listen to. This is Fresh Air. I'm Dave Davies, in for Terry Gross. In 2017, many were shocked to read of a study that found that more than one in three people in a poor area of Alabama tested positive for traces of hookworm, an intestinal parasite long thought to have been eradicated in the United States. The findings were not a surprise to our guest, Catherine Coleman Flowers. She's an Alabama native who for years worked to bring attention to the problem of people living without sewage treatment so that human waste collects in their yards and sometimes backs up in plumbing pipes and seeps into their homes. Hookworm spreads when the larvae of the worms penetrate the skin of people walking or playing in soil contaminated with feces. As you'll soon hear, the hookworm study was a direct result of Coleman Flowers' activism. For 20 years, she's worked with advocacy organizations, philanthropists, business leaders, and elected officials on the issue of basic sanitation. She's testified before Congress and a United Nations panel in Geneva, and earlier this year, she was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship to continue her work. She's written a new memoir about her life and the battle for universal sanitation. It's called Waste, One Woman's Fight Against America's Dirty Secret. Catherine Coleman Flowers is the founder of the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice, and since 2008 has been the Rural Development Manager at the Race and Poverty Initiative of the Equal Justice Initiative, founded by Brian Stevenson. She joins me from her home in Montgomery, Alabama. Catherine Coleman Flowers, welcome to Fresh Air. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You've been active on this issue for a long time and have brought a lot of people philanthropists, reporters, elected officials to rural areas to see for themselves poor people living with this problem of simply not having sanitary disposal of human waste. I'd like you to describe the experience of just one of these tours uh, and the reaction of those who saw what, what you showed them. Well, one of the persons whose reaction was, I think, sums it up was uh, Dr. Philip Austin. Dr. Austin was the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty. And when he was invited to Lowndes County as part of his official tour, he went to see areas where people were living amongst raw sewage. One of the, one of the homes that we went to, uh, it was a compound with a number of mobile homes that set off of a dirt road. And one could see the, the water lines that carried water into the home going above uh, what looked like a ditch full of raw sewage. And nearby was a um, was a basketball goal where children apparently played basketball. And when he saw it, uh, there was a, there were, were reporters with us um, on his his uh, his tour. And one of the reporters asked him, uh, "Have you seen this before?" And he said, "This is uncommon in the developed world." And I thought that that spoke loudly of of what I had felt for all of these years that I had seen this. And, and so what, what people would see, and you'd taken so many people to this and observed their shock at what they saw, was often you know, a piece of pipe, PCV pipe, running from a home or a trailer to you know, a hole in the backyard. And then when you get closer, what do you see there? When you get closer, you'll probably see human feces and toilet paper or whatever was flushed in the toilet that day. 
uh, the one place that we went um, that was that stands out in my mind is that it was full of it was a pit full of raw sewage, as you said. The the person had a PVC pipe, but there was a lot of a lot of ingenuity that's involved in this. They the the PVC pipe was buried underground, and it went to a pit, and in that pit again was full of you know raw sewage and. You could see the eyes of a frog that was embedded in the sewage and was peep, peeping out from it. And oftentimes, depending on the time of the year, and now that the days we have longer, warmer seasons, there are mosquitoes sometimes congregated on top of the sewage. Right, and those animals will spread this stuff to wherever they go. Exactly. You grew up in Lowndes County, Alabama. It's an interesting place in the history of the civil rights movement, isn't it? Yes, it's a very interesting place in the history of the civil rights movement. Most people know about Lowndes because of its fight for voting rights and the establishment of the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, which was the original Black Panther Party. Uh, and that the Black Panther was chosen because a lot of the sharecroppers had not been afforded the opportunity to go to school. So they wanted to use a symbol that people could understand. And it also, you know, I think one of the slogans from that time was pull the tail for the Panther uh, when they organized their own political party and ran candidates uh, on that party because at that time it was not... Um, Black people running as candidates wasn't accepted on either the Republican or the Democratic Party uh, in Lowndes County. So that itself was was a, a great accomplishment on the, the side of sharecroppers, former sharecroppers who had been kicked off of property just because they sought the right to vote. And, and that was the Lowndes County Freedom Party that preceded the, the Black Panther organization, right? Yes. Um, and it's also, is this area on the route of the famous march from Selma to Montgomery that, that Dr. King led? Yes, most of the Selma to Mon Montgomery march route goes through Lowndes County. Lowndes County is actually between Selma and Montgomery. You want to describe some of the rural poverty there? What distinguishes life there that, that, that brought you back there? You, you'd moved away and it had done lots of interesting things with your life. But I guess when you're in your middle age, you came back because you felt like the county needed help. Why did it need help? Well, I had always been involved um, as an activist in Lowndes County. And even when I didn't live in a county, no matter where I was, I would always go back and, and always stay connected to things that were happening. So when I came home, I was very surprised at what I saw. Um, you know, I grew up in Lowndes County before we had telephones or before we had a lot of the services that people take for granted today. And it was very, um, it was striking to me to see that some things had changed and some things had not. A lot of people were living in mobile homes. And a lot of these mobile homes were in serious disrepair because they charged a lot of money for these homes. But the homes were, were very hard to maintain. And as it got warmer, you know, you could see the mold and mildew on the outside of the homes, and in some cases on the inside of the homes. We saw homes that were falling apart where people had to step over boards on the floor uh, because the floors were weak. You know, the, the homes just were not sustainable. And a lot of people that are living in that type of poverty also have food insecurity. And because there are no grocery stores and not no access to fresh food, um, there are lots of diabetes, so much diabetes, in fact, that there are, uh, in some cases, the buses that provide, vans that provide transportation for people to go to dialysis two or three times a week. So it's that type of stark poverty, I believe. And some of these people are working. But they're working in jobs that are that are not paying a lot of money. They're not paying a living wage. And as a result, they're unable to have the type of access to health care and the other kinds of things to, to improve their quality of life. When you first came back to Lowndes County, you were working uh, in economic development in a job with the county. Your attention was drawn to this problem of a lack of sanitation. And I think I want to talk about just a little bit about why this happens. You know, I think most of our listeners 
have never thought about what happens when they flush the toilet, right? We flush it and it disappears um, because we're connected to a public, you know, sanitation and water system. What is it about these rural homes that make this problem particularly bad for them? Well, first of all, uh, there's no municipal system. I, usually when uh, people visit or they, especially if they call me and they've never been to a rural community, they ask, well, why don't they connect to a municipal system? Well, out in, the, in a lot of rural communities and suburban communities around the United States, people are on on site, uh, it's called on site septic systems. Uh, and the on site septic systems are something that the homeowner at least in, in Alabama, the homeowner has to, to purchase and put it in place. Um, recently, we were working with a family who uh, wanted or needed an on-site septic system, and we had the engineering done. You have to have a perk test done in the state of Alabama. Um, a perk test is when they are checking the percolation rate or the rate in which uh, water drains through the soil, and that can determine whether or not what type of system, uh, septic system is needed in, in that location. Lowndes County has dense clay soils. It holds water. So it makes it uh, harder. The other factor that we have found to be a problem is the water table. The water table is high. And the water table is getting higher because of sea level rise. A lot of people do not uh, do not account for that when, when they were talking about uh, on-site sanitation. And with that being a problem, this particular family that we were trying to help, they went down 25 inches and struck water. That's how high the water table was. I've been in situations where they've gone down six inches and struck water. So that means that, there, that there's a need for a different type of system. And the system designed for that property uh, was designed in such a way that the owner owned, uh, it was a half acre of property. The system needed to treat wastewater from the home would have taken up close to two thirds of the property. And it was, would have cost $28,000. And, and most families not just poor families, but middle class families in Lowndes County and other places in Alabama cannot afford that. You know, you write about how when you got involved in this issue of, of a lack of sanitation, you met an environmentalist with the state health department who um, he went to a meeting and people got kind of angry at him. And so he wanted to connect with you. you. He invited you to his office to kind of see what the health department was doing to deal with this. Um, tell us about that. What did you learn from it? Well, he and I had a lot in common, and that's why we were able to connect. And he showed me that, um, you know, what the permitting process was, how they maintain their records. It was all in a file, but he knew based on the number of permits that they had on file that most of the systems were not permitted. And while I was there, uh, someone came to see him to ask him about a woman um, who lived in uh, the community of Mosses and asked whether or not she had a permit for her septic system. And of course, when they looked and there was no permit there, he asked me would I ride with him. He took me over to her house and rode around her house and we could see not only was there um, raw sewage on the ground, it was almost coming up the, the back of her wooden home. Uh, and her bathroom was pretty much sitting that part of our house was sitting on the ground. So he he took that time to also drive me around and show me other areas where uh, he could tell just from the road that they had raw sewage on the ground because the grass was greener in that area. Right, you develop an eye for it, right? Yes. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that while you were in there with this health department official, that this guy had come in who was actually a builder, a contractor, right? And he wanted to know about this woman. Does she have a permit? Um, went over, discovered, no, she didn't have a permit for a septic tank. Um, and then you realized that there was probably a reason that this contractor was looking for this information. What was going on here? Because she would be cited. And once she was cited, she was put in a position where she had to get, she had to get it repaired. And then he could uh, do the do the work and make money from it. He could do the work. 
Yes. It, it was astonishing to me to read that a lot of people that are in this situation, where if, if they are in a circumstance where the health department inspects and they do not have a permitted and effective septic system, that they can be noticed and eventually arrested for failing to provide this? Well, what was happening in, in Lowndes County at the time, uh, people were being cited. Uh, and this is one of the things that this environmentalist explained to me, that they were they were cited. And they generally, be, they said, because the problem was so prevalent throughout the state, uh, we were told that at that time that their, their stance was to only act if somebody reported it. So... When it was reported to him, he would go see the situation and then he would send them a citation, giving them so many days to get it corrected. And after they didn't get it corrected, uh, within whatever that period of time was, they would go to court and the judge could issue an order for them to correct it. And where, the, where they were being arrested was when they apparently violated the order. You actually went to court a few times where people were facing arrest and explained to the judge, look, you're, you're asking this family to do something it doesn't remotely have the resources to do, right? Yes, I was actually invited to, when I went to that, went to court, I went to court at the invitation of the environmentalist. That's how I know they were, were in court that day. The health department environmentalist, right? Yes, the, the health department's environmentalist was concerned that, uh, what, that the person, a young man, would lose his job if he was arrested that day, if he was placed under arrest because he could not afford to put in his septic system. And apparently he had been trying to work with this young man, but it was just so expensive. And so when I went to court, uh, I did explain it to the judge and I explained to her that that uh, he couldn't afford it. I also explained um, that we were trying to help, you know, understand the problem and, and try to help families that were, were facing um, uh, potentially being arrested for not having septic systems, so she eventually let him go. But there were also there was also another person in the courtroom, and she had spent the weekend in jail, and had been arrested for not having a septic system. Wow, well, you know, I mean, the county is obliged to ensure. You know that there aren't dangerous and unhealthy conditions. That's why there's a permitting system. That's why they act. But it just doesn't make any sense to expect people to do what they cannot do, right? It doesn't make any sense. I agree with you. You know, in, in the book, one of the things we learn is that you are a woman who you do a lot of networking, you make a lot of connections, and you've been effective in getting business leaders, philanthropists, activists together, and you've helped a lot of people to resolve their problems. Um, is it harder to get people to pay attention to rural poverty than urban poverty, do you think? Uh, yes, it's very hard to get people to pay attention to rural poverty because most of most people don't understand it. Most people don't understand the way rural communities are organized because I often get questions like, why do they not have this? Or why do they not have that? When people come to visit, I have to tell them, write down the directions because there may come a time when you may not have a phone signal and you can't rely on GPS. So, or, or in the case where people look at an address and say, oh, that person lives in Tyler, Alabama, and assuming that Tyler, Alabama is in Lowndes County because it's part of the address. Tyler, Alabama is actually in Dallas County, and that's where the post office is located, <laughs> where their mail comes from. So that is it's those kinds of things that we have to teach people that are not familiar with rural communities. And, and, and because they're not familiar, a lot of things they just don't see. How much of this is about race? this kind of poverty? It depends on where it's located. I think it's about race and class. I think that uh, in Lowndes County, for an example, a lot of it is about race, but poor white people are having the same problems. If I've gone to areas outside of Alabama, uh, I've gone to, to Appalachia as part of the New Poor People's Campaign, I've seen it there too. The only difference with people were white. Or if one goes to indigenous communities, you see the same thing, Latinx communities. And now with COVID, I think the, the communities that are most vulnerable, that are probably uh, having the higher death and infection rates, are those communities that are living in extreme poverty and also do not have access to work and infrastructure. 
when you look at this problem of these individual poor homeowners, some in trailers, some of them in small homes that aren't connected to county uh, systems and septic systems are expensive, not particularly well suited to the clay soil and high water tables that you have there. Is there a big fix? What would it take to really resolve this issue for, for people that are suffering? Um, what it's going to take is, first of all, find, use some technology that works. This problem is not a, just a Lowndes County problem. This is a problem all over rural America, and it's also a global problem. Uh, to give you an example, uh, going outside of Lowndes County in the Miami-Dade County area, uh, I saw an article that said that they had an over billion dollar septic tank problem because of sea level rise. They're not working. Uh, now we're finding that wastewater, uh, the way wastewater is treated in, in some places, create more contamination. Um, in some cases, the uh, leaks from wastewater is contaminating the drinking water. Uh, leaks from wastewater is causing fish kills, uh, algae blooms. And we have not understood that it's time for us to develop green wastewater treatment that takes into account climate change. Um, tell us about hookworm what it does, how people get it. Oh, wow. Well, first of all, I have to qualify that by saying I'm not a doctor. Fair enough. My, understand <laughs> my understanding is that hookworm is an intestinal parasite that uh, when whenever a person uh, uses the bathroom their own feces ends up in the soil, uh, those worms can thrive there under the right condition and people come in contact with it when they either walk or play or whatever in those areas and it penetrates the skin and eventually ends up, you know, in the gut. So, but what it does is it can create malice in terms of health and in children, it can, it can make them anemic and it may impact their development. And I, we've also been told that uh, people that have illnesses, other kinds of, you know, health care disparities, it can make it worse and create malice. And the worst part of, of it is that this is not something that we test for in the U.S. because people don't anticipate that we have it. It's more of a term, um, they call it a third world il illness. But Dr. Peter Hotez has coined the, the, the phrase neglected diseases of poverty and hookworm falls under that category. Right. It's typically not fatal. It is treatable, but it is harmful um, and thought, thought to have been eradicated. Turns out it isn't. Um, this was discovered really as a direct result of your own experience investigating a property with open sewage. You want, you want to just tell us what happened here? Yes, I was actually called to the site by uh, people from the health department. It was the regional environmentalists and the local environmentalists uh, for, for the county and told me that they wanted me to go to this site and they had threatened to put this woman in jail. She was in her 20s and pregnant. So I went there and she lived in a single white mobile home and in the back of her home was a pit full of raw sewage with mosquitoes sitting on top of it. And I had on a dress with, and had on stockings and the mosquitoes were so, so attracted to me that they bit me through the stockings. I had a lot of bites. And afterwards, uh, my body broke out on the rash. And I had never had this happen to me before. And I went to my doctor and I, I asked her, I told her, ex explain what happened. Uh, and she did all these blood tests and they came back negative. And I asked her, was it possible that I had something that doctors can diagnose because American doctors don't expect these conditions here in the U.S.? And she said, yes. So later I read an op-ed that was written in the New York Times and uh, it was written by Dr. Peter Hotez. I Googled him, found his information, emailed him and told him about my experience. And it just so happened that he was going to be in Atlanta the next week and I went over and met him. We talked and he said, you know, I'm going to send my parasitologist there. We're going to look for hookworm. And that was my first time hearing about hookworm. Right. And in fact, then a study was organized. You ended up actually carrying samples to, was it uh, Baylor to Medical School? To Houston. Okay. Right. Um, and what it found was pretty alarming, wasn't it? It was very alarming. I was actually shocked by it. Um, 
and they found other tropical parasites too, but I was, I was very shocked by it. And we were all, we knew that this was kind of a smoking gun, if you will, but I didn't realize the impact of it on the American psyche once it was released. And I didn't realize that the attention uh, it would cause internationally uh, in the wealthiest country in the world to have diseases that are generally associated with extreme poverty. You know, you know, as you developed your campaign to deal with this, it was one of the things that struck me was that you worked with lots of people who you didn't necessarily agree with. There's a guy named Bob Woodson, who was a conservative um, who worked on, you know, development in poor communities. Not the most likely person that you might have connected with. Tell us a little bit about him and, and, and his role in any of this. Well, uh, I met Mr. Whitson at a faith-based summit in Washington. I, I, I heard him speak, and I approached him afterwards, and I asked him would he help me with Lowndes County. And he invited me to his office, and I brought people to his office, and later he came to Lowndes County himself. And it just so happened on that first visit, uh, we were there was a detour because um, one of the county commissioners, a female, said, Catherine, you have to go and see this site. You ha I want you to go visit this family. And I didn't understand what she was talking about. And that was the first time I encountered a family that uh, was, was dealing with the raw sewage issue and had been threatened with arrest. I think the husband and wife had been, been uh, arrested because they had a failing septic system. And uh, Mr. Woodson was deeply moved by this. Uh, he was, he's a person that uh, was born and raised in Philadelphia uh, who, who termed himself a Jack Kemp Republican, uh, but had a lot of deep respect in the communities where he worked. And these were primarily poor communities. Uh, uh, there's a part of Mr. Woodson that I think a lot of people don't know. They hear black political conservative and they stop. But he himself was also a winner of the MacArthur Award because of the work that he does in communities. And he told me that he didn't have any experience in rural communities, but he was willing to learn. And that relationship, he was able to bring a lot of resources and was very effective in a state that is Republican run. Right. So you, you got some momentum in part with his assistance. And, you know, what one measure of your pragmatism in this is that at one point, you know, you had connected with uh, Senator Jeff Sessions, the Republican representing Alabama, and wanted to get him interested. And to make sure he got interested, you actually organized a political fundraiser for him. Right. How did, how did, <laughs> yes. how did that go? Uh, it was very interesting because I, I knew that in order for him to to take Lowndes County seriously, he, he had to see us differently because all the, I, I, I was the economic development coordinator for the county at the time. And every time I would, would get in touch with someone, people would, some people would literally laugh at me and say, oh, there's the only reason to go to Lowndes County is to get to Selma or to get to Montgomery. So in order to change that and to make sure that we had a champion, uh, I had met Senator Sessions prior to then. And he he had a time, he had town hall meetings and I went to one of his town hall meetings and and asked the question. He was talking about the, the, the grants that they had available, but the grants required a match, usually a twenty five percent match. And the, the the county had no tax base. There was no way for them to pay for the matches, so they couldn't get the federal monies to deal with those issues. So I thought that it was a good idea to do this fundraiser and to invite local business people to participate people that were African-American and a local businessman did host it at his home. And a lot of people came and I was, I think that they were very, very uh, shocked. Uh, Senator Sessions people that people came and they talked to him about various problems that they were facing and wanted to address. And he became an advocate for us. Pamela Rush, you want to tell us her story? Yes, uh, Pamela is, was a distant relative. I didn't know her, but I knew her family. Uh, one of her sisters reached out to me through social media and asked me would I help her sister. And I did agree to go and meet Pamela. And when I met Pamela, I just couldn't get it out of my head uh, what I saw and what she shared with me. 
Pamela was a, a, her family was a victim and it was generational. It didn't just start with, with her. It actually, her, her brother and mother bought that mobile home and Pamela was still paying for it. But the, the home wasn't worth what they paid for it. If they had bought a house or built a house for the amount of money that they invested in that mobile home, it would have grown in value, but that mobile home has seriously decreased in value and also wasn't providing the kind of protection that the family needed. And she was struggling uh, with an income of less than $1,000 a month trying to maintain and also raise two children. And the home was full of mold uh, and had a lot of other issues that exacerbated her daughter's condition. Her daughter had respiratory problems and slept with a CPAP machine. So uh, Pamela was, she shopped at uh, secondhand stores to try to make money, um, you know, go as far as it could. And she expressed that she was just concerned that a lot of things she could not get for her children because she couldn't afford it. So one of the things that, that I asked her to do was, um, I said, I, I, I personally don't have the funds to help you, but I'd like to bring some people here and I hope that someone will be moved to do so. And she agreed. And out of that, uh, Pamela Blossom, uh, not only to, to receive strangers, because she was very shy, but ultimately she herself testified in Washington about being poor and, and even uh, hosted Senator Bernie Sanders at her home when he came as a presidential candidate at our invitation to see firsthand the type of poverty and the conditions that existed in Lowndes County. And then this year, tragedy struck. Yes, um, she was, like all of us, was afraid of COVID. And COVID just uh, started to, when it entered Lowndes County, it, it really created a lot of devastation. A lot of people died. And Pamela ended up uh, contracting, getting COVID. And ended up on a ventilator uh, and was unable to return home. And on July 3rd, she passed away. I want to talk just a bit about your earlier life. You were born in Birmingham, but you say your parents wanted to raise their family in the country. So you moved to Lowndes County. Uh, what were your parents like? <laughs> My parents were very outgoing people. Uh, they didn't meet strangers. I think maybe that's where I got my networking uh, chops from, but they didn't meet strangers. We always had people coming to our homes and they were, and local people would come to them whenever they had a problem. And I called them the jailhouse lawyers of the community. Uh, my father was a native of Lowndes County, so we were related to just about everybody. And he would put us in the car and take us to people's homes and tell us, these are your cousins. And uh, whenever people would come to visit if they were from Lowndes County, he would ask, the first question they would ask us, who are your folk? And then they would start that oral history of, of going down that family tree <laughs> and making a connection. So we were, we were surrounded by people that were activists who came from the outside and would always stop by to visit my family. And we were also surrounded by family, uh, people that were blood relatives to us that were, um, that never left Lowndes County or those that would come back to visit would, would stop by. So there was a lot of constant activity and they were also activists. Uh, my mother was uh, was an activist and was, was part of the welfare rights organization they had at that time, but she was also a woman who had been sterilized uh, at, at a hospital in Tuskegee where they were sterilizing black women from the black belt who were poor, who were going there and giving birth. So my, my last brother um, was born at that hospital and and the doctor that sterilized her was, was on of course, his birth certificate because he delivered him. Um, my father, on the other hand, was uh, was a Korean era veteran who flew a flag outside of our house, and he felt that he had fought uh, as a person in the military. Told he would always tell us five years, four months, and seventeen days. <laughs> that was the amount of time he spent in the service, and he felt because of that that uh, his service that he was entitled to all the 
the, the benefits that went along with being an American citizen. And that's why he flew the flag as a reminder. You know, you mentioned your mom's sterilization and passing in the book. Um, did you find out more about the circumstances? Uh, I, I knew about this when I was younger because that was kind of how I, what propelled me into activism. Uh, I happened to be there when a team from BBC came to interview my parents and, and she talked about this and I knew that she had organized, uh, women because a lot of women didn't talk about it. It's just like the wastewater problem. It was something people whispered about but never talked openly about. So she organized women uh, in the Black Bill, and primarily a lot of women in Lowndes County who had been sterilized because there was a legal um, action that was taken to prevent this from happening again. And later, um, I found out more about it as an adult, that there were uh, lots of women that had been sterilized uh, and it was paid for by the government. You attended the Lowndes County Training School. Um, you write that, you know, you realize you weren't getting a good education and you wanted a real education. So you and your parents decided to do something about it. Tell us how it went. Well, what ultimately happened, we were able to remove the principal from the high school. And uh, I had the opportunity to go to Washington uh, the summer at the end of my junior year as a Robert Kennedy Youth Fellow with the Robert Kennedy Memorial Foundation and met Senator Kennedy. Uh, and, and we had the discussion about training school. And he was the one that told me that training school denotes outside of the South was a school for delinquent children. So I was determined when I went back home that I was going to change the name of the school. So I talked to my parents about it because I was, you know, entering my senior year and I didn't want that on my diploma. So we went to the board meeting and we talked about that and brought that up to the to the school board. And one of the school board members said, well, you should be proud to go to a school named for William Lowndes. And William Lowndes, of course, was one of the first persons to advocate for secession from the Union over slavery. Uh, we we ended up getting the approval of the school board to change the name. And when I graduated from high school, uh, my diploma had Central High School, which had been the original name of the school before they changed it. You know, as a young person, you went from Lowndes County to Washington, D.C. You know, you met Senator Ted Kennedy in person. I mean, what do you think that experience did for you or gave you that experience in Washington at that young age? I think that experience in Washington showed me a world outside of Lowndes County and showed me possibilities. It showed me that the world was not just black and white. And in Washington, I saw women doing things that I did not see in Alabama. Uh, a lot of a lot of the, the people that I met uh, would come up to me. In some cases, people would look at me and they would assume that I was from another country. I never knew that about myself. I never knew that I looked like I could be from the Caribbean or could be from Ghana. You know, I never that never occurred to me before spending time in Washington. And it gave me a sense of possibilities beyond Lowndes County to open up my world. Well, Catherine Coleman Flowers, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Coleman Flowers is the recipient of a 2020 MacArthur Fellowship. Her book is Waste, One Woman's Fight Against America's Dirty Secret.